To examine the Sketcher Diagnostics tools, I'm going to create an extrude with an internal sketch. If I select a flat planar surface or datum plane, that puts me immediately into sketch mode. And let's change to our sketch orientation. And I'm going to start off by importing a sketch. And let's change the scale to 1. And I'm just going to drop it right in the middle here and hit the check mark. And right now I have my dimension and constraints display turned off just because it clutters up the screen in this situation. In the ribbon, you have a group of commands in the inspect group that provide different diagnostics tools. And two of them are on by default, shade closed loops and highlight open ends. And Highlight open ends, you can see over here, a little bit unfortunate that I have a red model here, but it highlights in red where we have an opened end over there, and we don't have a closed loop because this area is not shaded. By the way, if you want to turn those two buttons off by default, you can do that by going to File, Options, Configuration Editor, and if you click the Find button and then search on the word Sketcher, you can find there is Sketcher, Highlight Open Ends, and Sketcher, somewhere in here, Shade Closed Loops. And again, the default values for those are yes, and you could change them to no if you want. But I like having those options turned on, so I'm going to cancel out of there. And also we have this Feature Requirements button. When you click on it, it'll give you a list of requirements and whether you comply with them or not. So it says that the section must contain geometric entities. That's checked. Multiple loops must all be closed. Weird. Checked. Uh, and it says not all open ends have been explicitly aligned and cannot have more than one open loop. So let's go about fixing the problem. And one tool that you can use for doing that is highlighting overlapping geometry. Right now it's highlighting over here, indicating that I have overlapping geometry. Again, when I zoom and I can see that we've got this little bit of extra segment, so I'm going to use squiggle trim or delete segment to get rid of that. And we no longer have red highlighted there for that open end. I see some red highlighted down here at the bottom. So here we have a gap inside of here. I can use the corner tool and pick the two entities to extend them to one another. And now you can tell that the loop, the closed loop has been shaded as per this button over here. And if we go to feature requirements, we have two checks over here. Everything meets the requirements of this feature. So now we can use the check mark from the right mouse button menu to get out of sketch mode. And I can drag this to the desired depth that I want and hit the check mark. And that way we've used our Sketcher Diagnostics tools in order to create our feature. Let's take a look at the replace command in sketch mode. So I've got my part over here, just a few different features, and I decide that I want to change the shape of the protrusion. So I'm going to edit definition. If I go to the placement tab, this also has an internal section. I can click the edit button and let's go to our sketch view and I decide that hey you know what I don't want this to be a straight line I want to put an arc in there and so if I select that line and then hit the delete key I get this warning that says wait this entity is referenced by other features do you want to continue what Creo Parametric is telling me right now is that if I hit the yes button I'm going to get a regeneration failure and I'm not going to heed Creo Parametrics warning in this case. I'm going to say, yes, I want to get rid of it. We've got our open ends highlighted. Let's throw in an arc and I'm just going to create in here about yay big. And I'm not really going to care about the dimensions in here. Let's hit the check mark and hit the check mark to complete the feature. And now we see that we have a notification that we have a regeneration failure and the round in the model tree is failing. So let's undo this and I'm going to show you the proper way in order to make this change. So let's select the protrusion, edit definition, go to the placement tab and click edit to edit the internal sketch. 
I'm going to go back to my sketch view. And instead of deleting this entity, because again, if I try to do that, I get the warning. I'm going to heed the advice and say no. I'm going to create my new entity. Let's create our arc. Oops. Going out of the wrong part of the target. There we go. And again, I'm just eyeballing it. And now I've got my new entity selected. If you go to the operations overflow menu, there is a replace command. And just checking real quick, see if you get it. Yep, it's also available in the mini toolbar. And when I click on that, right now I'm getting an error that says, oh wait, incorrect choice, must pick old entity. So I like that little help there. So you start with the old entity and then choose the replace command and then pick the new entity and everything is good. Now when I hit the check mark and the check mark for the extrude feature, I don't get a regeneration failure because essentially the replace command will transfer all the children of the geometry that's created by the old entity with the new entity. So it transfers those parent-child relationships and helps you avoid having regeneration failures. Here I am in sketch mode and I'm going to take advantage of what's called the palette. The palette has a number of predefined shapes and by default the palette has four different tabs. The first one is the polygons tab and has everything from a three-sided, trying to make this a little bigger, rearrange this in here, a three-sided to 20-sided polygons. And from the profiles tab we have a C shape, I shape, L shape, and a T shape. Let's grab the C shape and I can drop it on the screen. And you've got a drag handle for rotating this. And I'm gonna rotate it 90 degrees. And also we have a button to change the scale. And I'm gonna change this scale to a value of 40. And we have a drag handle to change the drag location. Push, position your mouse over it Hold down the right mouse button and drag it to the point that you want to use as the drag location. And then we can drag the figure where we want it to be. And when we're happy, we can hit the check mark. You'll notice that the sketcher palette remains open so that you can place additional features in here. Besides the profiles tab, you also have a shapes tab. And you can see that we have a couple different waves in here. Arc racetrack, regular racetrack, rounded rectangle, cross and oval. And similar to the Polygons tab, we have the Stars tab with everything from a 3-tipped star to a 20-tipped star. You'll notice in here I have an additional palette tab, and it's got three different figures in here. And that's because I have a config.profile that, excuse me, config.profile option that points to a folder where I've stored .sec files. If you go to File and then options. I'm going to go to configuration editor. There is a config.pro option called sketcher palette path and I have it pointing to a folder on my computer. You'll notice that that folder is the same name as the tab that we have in the sketcher palette dialog box. Besides using this particular option, there is another option. I'm going to click the find button and type in 2D, and it's called 2D Palette Path. It does the same exact thing as the Sketcher Palette Path config.pro option. You can use either, or I believe even both of those options, to add additional tabs to your Sketcher Palette so that you could quickly and easily reuse sketches in your model. Let's take a look at using both the sketcher grid and applying cross hatching to a sketch. I'm going to start off by creating a sketch by clicking the icon in the ribbon. And before I pick my sketch plane, I'm going to go to the properties tab. And you'll notice that we have some grayed out text in here for add cross hatching and choosing the scale and the angle. For some reason, you're not allowed to define cross hatching before you make your sketch. So I'm going to select a plane to sketch on. 
Let's go into sketch mode and I'm going to change to my sketch view. And first off, let's turn on our grid that we can use. I'm going to go to the setup drop down menu and then display. And here we have grid display. You can also get to that from the display commands in the in graphics toolbar. So let's turn on the grid display and to reduce clutter, let's turn off our datum plane visibility. And if I zoom in, you can see there are faint grid lines on here. If you go to the setup drop down menu, you can go to grid settings and you could either use a Cartesian grid or a polar grid. Let's start with a Cartesian grid. And right now the spacing is dynamic. In other words, as you are creating your different entities, it's going to adjust the grid appropriately for you. But you could also change to a static grid. And let's say I want a one by one grid. Also, you could choose to change the origin to some other location if you wanted to. And you can also rotate the grid by some angle. But I'm going to leave it at a zero degree angle. And sometimes when you're sketching, it does become helpful to have a grid, especially if you're trying to make a regular uh, shaped figure and you already know the general proportions or dimensions that you want to use. And also, in addition to using this grid, if you go to File, Options, and then Sketcher, you can turn on the option for Snap to Grid. And this corresponds to the config.pro option, grid underscore snap. And so I can turn that on and click the OK button. I'm not going to add it to my config.pro file. And now when I go to create a line, you'll notice that's hopping around on the screen for the starting location wherever I move my mouse based on where that uh, where the different grid point locations are in the model. But let's delete this. I'm going to also show you how to do a Cartesian grid. So we go to Setup, Grid Settings, and, excuse me, I meant I wanted to show you how to do a polar grid. And for the polar grid, let's zoom in over here. Right now we have a radius of 1 for the grid, and we have angular, angular interval of 30 degrees and also 12 grid lines. You can change either or. They're obviously tied to each other. So for example, if I change this to 10, well, then they're going to be 36 degrees apart. And if I change this to 45, I'm going to have eight grid lines. And so now I still have my grid snap turned on. I could use this to create geometry. And again, make it out over here and it's snapping to the different locations and then close it off here. That's good. I'm going to hit the check mark and oops, where did my sketch go? Uh, there I have my sketch created. Now let's edit definition in order to turn on our cross hatching. Now if I go to sketch setup and the properties tab, I have the ability to check the box to add cross hatching and here we have our scale. Based on how big I made this, I'm going to guess that I want this to be a little smaller and right now it's at a 45 degree angle. Let's hit the sketch button and go to our sketch view just so that we're looking right on it. And now when I hit the check mark you can see that our sketch has cross hatching. If we decide that we want to change it again, just edit definition and go to sketch setup and go to the properties tab and then you can say, hey, you know what, instead of a 45 degree angle, I could use this drop down list to choose a different angle. Maybe I want 60 degrees and maybe I want it to be even tighter cross hatching. Hit the sketch button, hit the check mark to get out of sketch mode. And there you see cross hatching applied to the sketch. I hope you enjoyed this video. For more information, please visit www.creowindchill.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.